Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10 in your reading. I'm going to pick it up from the original King, New King James Version. We, we left off last week with the subject, Put God First. I want to just track that a little bit more and see what we can come up with this morning. Put that in the atmosphere. Put God first. Put God first. So he says it here in Proverbs. He says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns may will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Here's what he's saying to us in the scripture as we honor the Lord. We honor the Lord, our respect and reverence the Lord. And he wants us to do it with our increase or with our income. Another translation says the same thing uh, in the Christian Standard Bible. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first uh, produce of your entire harvest. Don't leave anything out. You honor him with it all. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. I want to start into today's lesson, a message, um, in regards to this elementary rudiments of teachings of tithing and giving and sowing. Many of you are way past that and you've already got this, but don't turn me off because hopefully something you will say will build and embolden your faith to trust God for even greater. Uh, for some of you, it's all new to you. You, you can't uh, um, put your mind around understanding uh, why the church need money, why the church always asking for money. Why is it always about money seemingly when it's a certain time of the year? Hopefully we can work some of those things out and give you some understandings of what we were trying to speak to you about. Last week I made a statement and I wanted to come back, circle back to that, and I said, God doesn't need your money, I do. Let me explain that. <laughs> In the sense of you thinking that God is broke, so you're trying to hold out the little you have and he owns all of it. And so you're thinking that you're holding out on him, you're holding out on yourself. So for is God, God is spirit. We are human and spirit. God doesn't need a building. The heavens of heavens cannot contain him. Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and everything that dwell therein. So it's not that God needs your money, but he needs your worship in your money. So as you give of your resources or give of your offering, your time and your talent, it's a part of your worship in giving to the Lord. I needed to pay this light bill and make sure we keep up with technology and make sure you can. But thank God that you have given something so we can at least let you hear me. Can you hear me back there? Isn't it wonderful? I need to make sure that when you go to the restroom, you don't walk in and walk out. As you did sometimes ago at that that place. I need it so when you pull up on the parking lot, you don't pull up and you have to walk on gravel and sand and dirt to get to the church. We need it to beautify the house of the Lord. David said in one place, he said, how can I rest when the house of God lives up under a tent, a badgered skin, when I live in a house of cedar? The house, the house of God should look better than anybody's home. Top notch. Because it is the house of the Lord. Well, God is the spirit. We are the temple of the living God. Yes, but we gather together as a body of believers in a place to worship. So as you give your resources, we become now stewards, householders. And those that work with me become householders of the house of God. I know I've been in church a long time. If something was broke, y'all let me know. And if it gets too hot in here in a few minutes, like, uh-uh, something's wrong. Malachi 3 bears to us that we bring the resources into the house of the Lord where we're being fed or being nurtured or being taught or growing up, and our faith is increasing. We bring it to the house of the Lord, and therein then we become stewards to make sure the house of God is kept up. God uses people to provide for his house. When I first started pastoring, I, I told Mary often, I said, I wish to God, Lord, if I can just get behind a Brinks truck. I wouldn't keep it, but I would bring some to the house. 
it was hard getting up talking about money and offerings and giving because the, the faces you see, wasn't that many people in the building, they said, here you go again. Like, we have to expand. But one guy named Deacon Richard Lovewick told me, you have not because you ask not. All you got to do is ask. And then you decide on what you're going to get, or get what's going to be given. So we bring into the house of the Lord, and this is the principle. God uses people to get things done. Last week I talked also about the husband in the house and the household being growing together as a family. But the husband keeps coming home after he's cast the check at Nick's check cashing. And he comes home and gives the wife just a little bit of money to run the house. And she looks at him like, this ain't going to keep the house going. So it takes everyone to put something in to make sure the house can stay afloat. Amen? Now, I'm, I'm very country, so I'll use a lot of metaphors of thoughts, but you'll, you'll get it. I went to the refrigerator one time and told my dad, there's no orange juice in the refrigerator. He said, put something in there. <laughs> we can always talk about what's not there, but what are you putting into what's not there? Put God first is a giving of an act of faith. Someone said that faith that is not been tested, cannot be trusted. Faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. Hmm. Regardless of how you look at it, it always comes down to resources. Not just money, but our time, talent, and our treasure. So regardless of how you look at it, again, it takes money to run ministry. And God's financial plan for his church is through people. We got that. Again, elementary rudiment things. Under the Lord, with your possessions, with your possessions, everyone has different possessions, and with the first fruits of your produce of the entire harvest. We can just cut across the field and think about the shoes in your closet you have not worn yet, but you wanted them. That's the right. I'll be right back. The shoes in your closet... <laughs> of the clothes that you bought that you have not worn yet but you wanted them don't worry I brought a few eight mans this morning I know there's a couple around here somewhere <laughs> but we pay for what we want how much was that Beyonce ticket why y'all ooh and did y'all price it out we pay for what we want Honor the Lord with your harvest, that your barns may, will be filled with plenty, and your vats shall overflow with new wine. We want to overflow, but we must honor the Lord to get that overflow. Uh, I talked about that. Stewardship. Stewardship is a householder, one that manages the things that's given to them. You all, we all have stewardships in our households, and we must honor, we must manage those things that we have in our house. So God sees that we're faithful over the few things, he'll make us ruler over many. God uses people. He uses people. In my study, I'm finding that um, putting God first, money becomes a, a barometer of where God is at first in my life. And that barometer is a spiritual barometer because we, how we handle money determines how we love God. As Christians, our lifestyle deals with money. I was coming church and I had to turn that song off in my dialogue money 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 <laughs> I'm sorry I told you I got a lot of some people <laughs> strange things huta <laughs> huta good and for you Gen Z's millennials wait till I get my money Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Julia. Oh. Money brings us into the introduction of a Christian community. Money also brings us to the place of how we handle money. We often think about if I can get the money back that I kind of messed over. I would be better positioned right now. Money, we pay bills with it. We need it for that. We have direct deposits, so we have to make sure the money gets to our account. Money flows through us all the time. 
different forms of payment with money. Some are still writing checks, some has debit cards, we have credit cards, we have Apple Pay, electronic funding, we've got all kinds of ways we can pay money. I've seen some young people go up to each other and tap each other's phone and they change money. Somebody bring me a phone quickly. There's so many ways you can get to money. You always want it, you gotta have it. So it's hard not to think about money when money's always around you. It's part of your everyday, um, part of our everyday lifestyle that we go through from time to time. So as stewards over our household, God requires us to be faithful over the things, again, he's placed us over. The modern day payments, we just look at them and they're changing as we speak. They're talking about just having something where you could just wave your hand and pay for things. I don't know. I read in Revelation it was called a mark, but I don't know. Stewardship is managing money is critical for all of us. It's a part of our lifestyle, even as Christians. And it's difficult, but we should be focused on being systematic and productive with our time, talent, and abilities and giving to God with, with, money, with the money that we do have. The Bible speaks a lot about the subject of money, and also it talks to us as Christians about how we should handle money, um, how we feel about money. It's something, everybody has different feelings about money. Some people like it, some people don't want to have it, some people don't care about it at all. They have a different idea about money. But one thing you should not do, according to 1 Timothy 6 and 10, don't love money. Don't love money. Money, loving money is the root of all evil. Not the money, but the covetedness of loving money. It becomes your God. Don't allow it to control your life. The root of all evil is the love of money. It, before you know it, the desire becomes more attentive to you than the things of God. Put God first, not the love of money. This, this in turn is the results of, Paul is speaking about the inter, in turn, the results of money and what it does to you if it's got for evil gain. As Christians, we should not put our trust in money. First Timothy 6 and 17 says, charge them that are rich in this world to trust not in uncertain riches. Money will come and money will go. And before you know it, you're in a cycle again. Let me put this, not in my notes, but let me try to talk to you that are always feeling like I'm always struggling. Um, in the words of Dr. McClaney, if money ain't coming in, it's going out. So if I got more coming out, going out than coming in, I shouldn't be that shocked that I'm in a tight place. I have a job, work a job, put money from that job, didn't get upset with the job, so I ain't gonna, I'm not going to work anymore. Rents do. Cardinal's not going to stop. Or just living itself. But now I'm in a hard place and I come to church and the first thing I hear when this preacher on Sunday morning talking about money. Because I did not prepare myself for what I was going to have to be going through in life. I need more to live on. The older I get, the more I need to reserve for retirement. But I can't look at money like I don't need it then look up and I need it and want somebody else to give it to me. I must work for myself and labor for myself that I might be able to take care of myself and my family. Put God first, not things, not money, but God. God is the one that supplies. He supplies everything that we need. Matthew 6, 23 says it like this, you cannot serve God and riches or money. Cannot serve them both. You become now a servant to what you give your attention to. No one can serve, Matthew 6, 23, two masters. Either they will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Even the qualifications of an elder, he must or she must not be one, a leader, one that's greedy of money or filthy lucre. Filthy lucre is wearing that I'm manipulating things to get more money. Careful how you treat money. It is a barometer of your worship and how you love God. And stop buying stuff, wearing it, taking it back to the store. Don't do that.
just to put your money back in your pocket. Giving is not God's way of raising money, but giving is God's way of using us to become his children, raising us up to become his children. Every time you sacrifice and give a little bit of yourself away, your money away, your time away, and your talent away, God is praised because you're putting him first. Our money is a central part of our worship. I said that earlier. And when we give to God, we are giving an important part of ourselves as we give to God. People always seem to say that if I had more, I would give more. If, if I had a million dollars, I would give a million dollars. Maybe so. But God's trying to see what you're going to do with the $10 and the $100. And what I gave you, you said you didn't have, but you said when I get it, I was going to give God some of it, but I didn't. There's a story about a preacher who went to visit a farmer. The preacher said, say, if you had $200, would you give 100 of it to the Lord? The farmer says, yes, I would. The preacher said, if you had two cows, would you give one of them to the Lord? The farmer says, oh, yes, I would. The preacher said to the farmer, if you had two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord? The farmer says, now, you know, I got two pigs. <laughs> you see, we only give what we want to give. That's why we don't try to have a line of auctions. I want everybody to give a thousand, everybody give a hundred, everybody give a ten. You have to know what you're going to give from your heart. Because I might go through the whole auction off and say, well, I don't have nothing to give. Yes, you do. Everyone has something to give. Remember the story that comes to me in Mark's gospel in the 12th chapter in verse 41 through 42. A very memorable story. There was a widow's offering there. And Jesus said, opposite of the treasury and saw how they was uh, how the crowd was casting money into the treasury many rich people were throwing in large sums i don't know it must have been a sunday morning offering us our time to give the riddle who was um poverty stricken came and put in two copper mites or uh, two car two copper uh, two copper mites or uh, small corns coins i'm sorry which together was a half of a cent and he called the disciples to him and said to them, truly, surely, I tell you, this widow, she who is poverty stricken, has put in more than all those combining to the treasury. For they all, all, threw, they all throw in out of their abundance, but she out of her deep poverty has put in everything that she had, even all she had on which to live. I read it from the Amplified Bible. I pondered this subject on putting God first. The widow woman shows that she is impoverished and have no one to support her. But it came time for her to give. In this particular place of giving a treasury, there were seven trumpets that were laid across, and they would come in and put their monies into these, these trumpets. And Jesus noticed that she was putting something in that was so small that no one recognized it but him. It tells me that no matter what you give, he's always watching what you give and how you give. And the size of it really didn't matter. It was the sacrifice by which she gave it. Selflessly, her heart was open to give. And she gave the best gift she knew how to give. The collection was there. She had two, her last. She could have put in one, but she put in both of them. Sometimes God pushes your faith to see where you're going to go when you only have a little and you can get a whole lot more. Not Jesus' slot machine. No, 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 no. It's Jesus' faith machine. Two small mites, two small pennies. She dropped both of them in there. Her generosity was seen, and Jesus wanted the disciples to get the attention off of the big givers and give the, get your attention on the one that's given this small might. The generosity here is, is the quality, not the quantity, that she was generous and liberal out of her heart. I want you to know God is gracious towards you, and he is mindful of the little that you give. But be consistent with that. 
and keep putting God first. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says it like this. The generous soul will be made rich. He who waters will also be watered himself. You may not get the water back from the person you're being generous to, but God has somebody lined up to be generous back to you. It's just part of his, the way he does things. You're looking for it this way, and God's got somebody coming from a whole nother direction, says, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I just feel I need to just, just lay this a little something, something on you right here, and let you, God bless you. That's the way God does. I like to do generous things uh, not known, not being known in secret so God can reward me openly. So I'm sitting in IHOP and I'm eating my food. The Lord says, pay the check. I said, what check? That check. I said, I don't know those people said, pay the check. I said, Lord, really? Come on now. I said, pay the check. So I'm sitting there trying to covertly ask the young man, that's the family, what's the check? He said, let me go ask. Said, no, hold on, hold on. Don't go ask them. Look at the register. Tell me what the check is. I don't care what it is. What's the check? He says, okay, the check is this. So I paid the check. I walked out. As soon as I walked out, cash out. God knows how to restore before you even get out the building. Two mice. Jesus says, check this girl out. Did y'all see what she's doing? She, did you see what she just put in? He begins to praise your gift to those who did not even recognize you. And begin to show them this is how you give. You give so I can reward you openly. God loves us when we're generous and we give liberally and give freely. Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians 9 and 6 and 7. Remember this, whosoever sows sparingly, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Whosoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whosoever sows graciously will also reap graciously. Each time you give, God's watching what you get. And as you give it and put in him first, he gives back to us. Generous giving. Did you not know, according to Romans 12, that there is a gift of generosity? Romans 12, 7 through 8, he says, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If your gift is teaching, teach well. If your gift, if your gift is encouraging, encourage well. And if your gift is giving generous, generously, then give generously. God loves a generous and a cheerful giver. Now, let me close on this one. Luke 6, 38. Give and gifts. I'm sorry, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Give and gifts will be given to you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Will they pour into the pouch from by the bosom of your robe, by the bottom of your robe, I'm sorry, that you use as a bag. For with the measure you deal out, with the measure you use, when you confer benefits on others, it will be measured back to you. Um, Julius, bring, bring me one of those um, uh, prayer cloths. I'm not about to shout or fall out. Just give me a prayer cloth. Measure what you give. What's one right next to you, Ray? Yes. Measure what you what you give. So the sh the shawl of the cloth that they had, it was hold a set. Let me chill. Was something they wore as a rope. So the rope was wrapped around them as as a, as a garment. When they got ready to give, they would pull the rope up and make a pouch, like so, and begin to pour it out on benevolence to someone else. With the same measure that you give, it's gonna come back to you. Now, this is a good load right here. But if, if I keep coming to church, and this is all I have, to give or to pour, 
and this is what I'm going to pour. That's all I have. It's the two mites. But if my heart is not right in giving this to, knowing that I could get a pouch and give it, then God's going to measure me according to what I give. The quantity, not the quality. So if I keep just coming, there you go, Jesus. There you go. And then you look up next month and you need a dumping of a load of a blessing. I got to look back and see what have I sown? What have I given? It's time to pull your robe up. And get a, a good load of money, a good load of talent and serving and pour it out on the Lord. I promise you, you can't beat him giving. As soon as you pour it out, he'll pour it back up on you. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together and running over. The overflow is in how you respond. You can't get an overflow from a thimble. But you can get an overflow from a bucket. As you pour out, God will pour back into you. Now, I know I'm shaking you up this morning, but I'm waking you up also. Because if I can shift my mind to trust God with my finances, then I will never have to worry about this worrisome stuff anymore in my life. Just believe the word and so shall you prosper. So shall you be established. Well, I don't have nothing to give. You have something to give because it's coming from your heart. I challenge you to give God a heart-filled giving blessing, heart-filling seed to give to him as you know, Lord, I don't have anything at all, but all that I have, you gave me. All that I got, you allowed me to have. I spent on so many things. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to see if I can trust you just one more time. If this poor widow woman could do it that didn't have any other resources, then surely I can do it. If I move into the faith lane, Get out the fear lane and believe God. Come on. Who gave you the job? Who gave you the house? Who gave you the health? Who gave you the breath? Who woke you up? Who gave you the ability to do what you're doing anyway? You couldn't say you did it yourself. God must have done it. So if he's done it, put him first. Let him be number one in your life. Amen. Look at somebody say, let's try God once again. Not testing him to fail, but believing him to succeed. Put God first. Father, we bless you now. It is your word you've sent to heal us. It is your word you sent to make us better. We trust you in this season. It's the beginning of the year. I'm going to start out with every intention. You will be first in my life. I'm going to serve you. It's time for me to shift my selfishness and find something to do in the kingdom. I need to come and serve because you've given me so much and you've been such a blessing. If not in the house, in the streets, soul winning, witnessing, bringing people to the kingdom of God. But I need to start showing myself generous towards you because you have been so kind to me. I never thought in my life I would have what I have. So I will make it a point to remember what you have done in my life. Nobody in my family living like I'm living. Nobody in my cousin them got what I have. And I'm going to sit around like I did it myself? Oh no. I will always remember where you brought me from. And it ain't over yet. Because the best is yet to come. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Put God first. 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 Give God a shout in the house.
please be seated for a moment. If you're still bringing a seat, you can bring it, no problem. Listen, if you're here this morning, you're not saved. I think it's time for you to put God first, the first part of this year. You went through all last year, you made it to the end, and now you're at the beginning of a new year. Let's start out right. Put God as number one in your life and come and serve him. Reconnect with the Lord. Recommit to the Lord. Allow him to be Lord of your life in a way of salvation. He loves you. He cares about you. We love you. And knowing the end is near, we're trying to persuade you to come to Jesus. Give him a chance in your life. You tried everything else, so give Jesus a fair chance. If you're here this morning and you decided within yourself to listen to this message, one of sacrifice, one of giving, one of honoring God, and you say, Pastor, I think you're talking to me. I need to rearrange some things in my schedule. I got time for everything else. I need to make time for the Lord. Heads bowed quickly. I want to just get your attention in this. Listen to me as your head is bowed. I need to come back to the Lord and put him first in my life. If that's you, raise your hand up. Say, that's me. I need to get myself back to the Lord. If your hand is up, stand up quickly. I'm going to pray for you. If your hand is up, stand up. Hand is up, stand up. If your hand is up, stand up. Don't be a shy. Don't be ashamed. Nobody's looking around, I believe. But right now, just hold your hand up. Hold your, if your hand is up, stand up. I need to put God first. He needs to be number one. Quit making excuses and complaining about all of that I don't have, where I can't go, what I'm not doing, and get back to putting God first in my life. Father, they're standing and they're online, even raising their hand, pointing towards the television, or pointing, listening to their listening device. I pray now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would draw them closer. Their hearts are open to put you as Lord and number one in their lives. Save my sister, save my brother. Touch their hearts to never let this moment slip away again. They'll continue to walk towards you and let you be the guide. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, The heart of man plans, but Lord, you direct our steps. So direct my steps. I want to be filled with your spirit, surrounded by your love, and kept by your grace. If you're standing, hold your hands up and say, Lord Jesus, today I put you first in my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Restore me, renew me, and save me. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give a God a praise for them. You guys are awesome.